My name is Emin Milli. I'm a writer uh, from Azerbaijan. I'm also a former prisoner of conscience. Um, and is this your first IGF? Yes, this is my first IGF. And to be honest with you, I was quite confused because it's such a huge event. But it's very good that it now uh, was held in Azerbaijan. And I hope I will participate in future IGFs and use it uh, to um, attract attention to concerns of civil society. So then, why is the IGF? Why is it an important event? Why is it important to you, your nation, or for any individual? You know, um, I've read, uh, let's say, concerns uh, expressed by Amnesty International. If actually uh, is is it a good idea at all to hold, you know, event like IGF in uh, authoritarian country? Uh, and I think that as someone, you know, uh, who lives here and who uh, struggles with this autocracy to push the borders of freedom, I think uh, the uh, benefit of IGF, the benefit of IGF holding here is, uh, is great for our civil society because it's one of these rare moments of attention of you know leading uh, you know companies like Google Twitter or you know other organizations like internet society global media uh, you know coming to Azerbaijan it creates for civil society in this country which is very marginalized and quite weak you know after 15 years of repressions to get uh, uh, you know a platform a global platform where we can talk about issues of internet freedom, of freedom of expression, of media freedom in Azerbaijan, and uh, it depends, I think, how you use it. So I wrote, I use this uh, uh, IGF, for example, to address the president in an open letter, which was published in Independent, a British newspaper in uh, Gazeta Wyborcza, biggest Polish newspaper, in uh, Tagesspiegel, one of the biggest newspapers in Germany, and in various other uh, uh, online global media platforms. So, uh, uh, um, and, and I think that uh, our civil society or activists uh, or journalists wouldn't have anything from not having this event here. I, mean, I have made a lot of contacts. My friends are working hard to create new contacts to convince the global policymakers on the issues of internet freedom and human rights you know, to pay more attention to Azerbaijan. Uh, I was trying here, for example, to make my case, to make Azerbaijan as a study case for a new phenomenon, which I call autocracy 2.0, when basically, you know, president of a country says internet is free, but I question, as a former prisoner of conscience and someone who was basically punished for writing my thoughts on internet, mostly, uh, you know, how free it is. You know, technically it is free. Right? So I can go now write whatever I want, there is no blockage. But uh, then later I'm punished, and not officially because I was writing something on the internet. No, they can find drugs in my pocket, they can do things like this. So I think it's very good to have IGF to use this platform, and I really would urge actually IGF organizers in the future to hold IGFs only in authoritarian countries. Of course there are countries where you cannot do it, where they you know, kill people, hundreds of them, but it's, I think it's not it's extreme cases. There are a lot of autocracies which allow for some space and I think it's better rather to come, to engage, to take that space and to expand it. And engage is for me not to come and to smile and to be silent, it's to come, to engage and to say everything to them in the face, to tell uh, to autocrats the truth in their face. That's what I call engagement, and I hope IGF will continue holding this event only in authoritarian countries. Very good. Now, one last question for you. Could you maybe list or tell us the top two challenges in internet human rights, and what do you think they are? Well, uh, to be honest with you, I think um, that uh, First of all, it's really hard to talk just about internet because, again, I'm talking about Azerbaijan. If there is fear, if people live in fear, okay, even if internet is technically free as in Azerbaijan, but people are afraid, you know, to like, to share, because they are losing jobs and so on. So that's not internet freedom. That that cannot be accepted as a country where internet is free because it's not free. And uh, that has to do, of course, with internet, with freedom, 
uh, which you cannot really distinguish between offline and online. It is together. It cannot be separated, you know. And because there were some discussions about this, I think it cannot be separated. And it's very important that when we talk about internet freedom, we don't forget that you know there are human rights offline, like they are inseparable from human rights online. This is the first. So it's a, I think complex approach is needed. Uh, and second, I think that um, um, uh, very important is to think about the spread of internet and about the quality of internet because there are still billions of people on the planet who don't have access to internet and I hope that uh, actually we can come uh, at some point in the future with technologies which would enable you know uh, for all these billions of people who currently don't have access to internet to have access and those who let's say uh, have access like Nazbajan the government says more than 65% of people have access to internet but uh, recent research has shown that only 7% of people daily use internet so there's a huge difference between you know if you come and once in a month touch the mouse and you know go online uh, or if you daily use it because Regular if you user. don't really daily use it then it means you cannot really be empowered, you cannot... You're not you taking know, fully advantage of it. Exactly. So I think this is the second uh, challenge uh, I think we uh, as internet, world internet community have to look at. Great. Well, thank you very much for your time. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much.